I remember a few years back going to the city of Rome in Italy. And I remember looking at the Colosseum. If you don't know what the Colosseum is, it's this um, ancient uh, structure, a wonder of the world, actually, and and built um, many many years ago. And it's just it's really a, a sight to behold. And one of the things that you that you think when you look at this thing is how do they do it? One of the architectural elements that stands out to you when you look at the Colosseum is the pillars. So all around the sort of sides and in in the corridors and really holding up this whole structure are these granite pillars. And then everything is stacked on top of them. Now, uh, I found out something this week about how they did exactly that, how they, how they built things with these pillars. So what would happen is there would actually be sculptors off-site, right? And they would be given the work of producing the pillars. And they would actually um, make the pillar out of a single piece of granite. So they would chisel all the things away until what you were left with was the pillar. And then they would send the pillars over to the build site, Colosseum in this case. And then guys would stack big blocks of granite or whatever it is that they were building on top of those pillars on to the pillars. Now, there's a story about these pillars is that very often what would happen is the pillars would get sent over to the build site and then people would try and start stacking things on top of the pillars and when they stacked it on top of the pillars, what would happen is the pillar would actually crumble under the pressure. It would break. Okay, So then they would send it back and get the guys to make it again and then they would send over the pillars again and then they would stack things on top of the pillar but the pillar would break because the weight of the of the massive blocks that were going on top of the pillar was actually too heavy for the pillar to hold. So they looked at these pillars and what they started to realize was that many of these pillars were actually inferior in their nature. They had cracks in them. And so although they looked good on the outside, when you would put the block on top of the pillar, the cracks would be exposed and they would crumble under the weight. So they started speaking to the sculptors about this and asking them to correct that and make sure there were no cracks in the pillars. So the sculptors obviously got onto this, but they realized that to really um, make a pillar without any cracks was a lot of work. So they took a shortcut. What they would do is they would make these pillars and very often the cracks would still be there. But then they would take wax and they would pour it into the center of the pillar from the top. And this wax, as it would go into the center, would fill up the cracks so that when you looked at the pillar from the outside, it didn't look like it had any cracks in it. And so they would send the pillars back over to the build site. The guys would inspect these pillars. Everything would look good. They'd put weight on top of it. But then again, as soon as the weight was on top of it, the pillar would crack under the pressure. And they couldn't understand what was happening until they had a closer look. And they found out that this is exactly what the sculptors were doing. They were putting wax in the pillars in order to disguise the fact that the pillars were actually too weak to handle the load. So then when they would ask for pillars, they would say to the sculptors, please make us these pillars, but please do so without wax. So please make sure that the pillars that you send us don't have wax in them so that they are strong enough actually to hold the weight of what we're going to put on top of them. Now here's here's what's fascinating about that word without wax. The root word of that is a, a word that is sincerus. Right? I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but it's the root word of our word sincere. Okay? And it means without wax. So to be sincere is to be without wax. (laughs) Okay? This is what we're going to talk about today. What does it mean for us to be sincere in ourselves? To have coherent views and perspectives of the person of God and of life so that we can walk through the world without wax. Why is this important? Because truth, and truth is a thing just by the way, we live in a world that doesn't want to acknowledge truth. Everybody thinks that truth is relative and your opinion is your opinion and my opinion is my opinion. But the truth is that even if you don't believe in gravity, when you jump off a roof, you will know you are wrong. And we've said it here before, I think the truth is whatever you crash into when you realize that you're wrong, or as the person who was um, teaching us this week, beautiful lady, Judy Orrit, if you're listening to this, thank you for your time. Uh, She gave us this beautiful perspective is that truth is God's perspective on anything. (laughs) Truth is God's perspective on anything. So however God sees a thing, that really is what's true. That's what's real. Reality is God's perspective on anything. And when you place truth on yourself. Truth has weight to it. Okay, And so if we in and of ourselves are not sincere in our belief systems, if our belief systems, if our worldviews are not without wax, what ends up happening is that the weight of truth that's placed upon us actually ends up cracking us and we end up crumbling 
under the pressure. And then our response is one of two things. Either we resist truth because we know that we don't, we can't handle the weight of it. And so we end up living in ignorance or fantasy. Or what happens is we actually buckle under the pressure of truth and we can't deal with what's been revealed to us. And so what we need to do then is we need to inspect our belief systems to ask ourselves, are our belief systems without wax? Are they sincere in their nature? Are they authentic? And do they have the capacity to handle the weight of truth that get put on top of them? And that's what we're going to talk about in this session. Who is Jesus? What is he doing? And what does it mean to follow him in the world today? My name is Matt Lewis. This is the Follower Podcast. And everyone is invited to the conversation. Cool. So we're talking about uh, basically a whole bunch of things. <laughs> Let me say uh, right off the bat, um, to this last week that we came out of, uh, uh, unlike the week before it, the curriculum, the, whatever we were talking about wasn't exactly clear. It was kind of like Judy, who was our teacher, she just came and brought the gift of herself, which I just loved so much. She just kind of, uh, Judy's this uh, lady who's been in, in mission and ministry for so long. I, I actually wanted to interview her for this podcast, but unfortunately she had to um, run off to Berlin. Um, but she, she's just kind of, you know, one of those people who just walks into the room and they just carry like a weight and an authority and a, sort of a deep wisdom about them. And so when she was uh, lecturing us and teaching us this week, she just kind of opened up her life to us. And so as a result of that, w- what this is, is it's kind of like a, you know, like a buffet. <laughs> it's just, we're just going to talk about a whole bunch of beautiful ideas. And uh, I'm kind of hoping that this lands with you and sticks with you. As it needs to, as whatever is helpful for you and as I'm processing it for myself, whatever those things are that stand out to you, um, I hope that they're helpful. The big frame of it really is kind is this idea of sincerity and, uh, and the degree to which our perspectives and our worldviews, the authenticity of those things, give us the capacity to enter into real truth. Now, this is a, a very, it's a, this is a complex issue and a really big subject and actually one that's kind of close to my heart. Uh, why do I say that? L- let me give you an example. I think that uh, what happens is that every single person on the planet has a couple of desires, right? Um, basically, to know who they are, to know why they are. So, uh, what, what, am I, what are we doing here? Who are we and where are we from? So we want to know questions of origin, we want to know uh, questions of identity, and we want to know questions of purpose, right? Where are we from, Uh, why are we here, and where are we going? What are we doing here? Those those are sort of the three big questions that are built into the soul. Now, if you're someone who's listening into the session and you're not really sure about who Jesus is, uh, and you're not sure you even believe in Jesus... The fact that these questions resonate with you is already reason for you to start to consider the things of God. There's this beautiful um, verse in the Bible that talks about how eternity has actually been set into the hearts of people. And there's this other guy, his name's Paul, and he writes, and he says, nobody actually has an excuse not to believe. Because when you look at all creation, creation sort of reveals to us the reality of this God. And so um, these, these different themes and thoughts that go throughout Scripture, this idea that Actually, um, something is crying out from within us and something is crying out from around us that makes us reach for the transcendent, for meaning, for ultimate truth. We've spoken about this here before. And these three questions, they do seem to be universal questions, questions of origin, identity, and purpose. Where are you from? Who are you? And what are you here to do? And it's interesting to me that these questions uh, exist across the spectrum in different cultures, uh, in different socioeconomic brackets, uh, different genders. It seems like these are built-in questions that pull us almost like magnetically to some kind of ultimate truth. Now, because we have these questions, uh, what, we, what we can't do is resist the need to, to make something our ultimate purpose. Okay, let me, let me put this another way. No matter who you are, you have a God. And we touched on this actually in the last session. So because you have these inbuilt, automated impulses, desires, and longings, you must make a God of something. Now, very often, if we haven't come to, well, let me say this, always, (laughs) always, our starting point of that God 
is superficial, just like us. Okay, And this is true for Christian people as much as this is true for any other person. If, let's say, for example, you don't grow up in a Christian home, you don't grow up believing in God, you, you grow up in sort of an atheistic worldview perspective, you have these questions of origin, identity, and purpose. Okay, You start to attach these questions and fi- look for the answers in the things that the world gives. So let's say, uh, very stereotypically now, the money, sex, power, right? Those would be our sort of three big, uh, big idols and different versions of those things. You start attaching that, uh, your, your question and your sense of meaning to these things. So you end up drinking a lot, you end up sleeping around, you end up climbing up the corporate ladder, and you're looking for your sense of significance, your sense of origin, identity, and purpose in these things. So what's broken inside of you is that you are bent in on yourself, and your primary pursuit and purpose and passion is still you. You are still looking for, for something that ultimately revolves and centers around you. Okay? Then someone comes to you and starts to tell you about the person of Jesus. And you hear about this person of Jesus, and something stirs within you. Now, here's what we know about in the scriptures, right? Is that those of us who come to God, those of us who have a revelation, whose eyes are open to the understanding of who Jesus is, this is a supernatural miracle. This is a grace gift, really. And so what ends up happening is we start to understand something at a supernatural level that we have not yet comprehended at an intellectual level. So there's something that bypasses the mind and hits us at another space that brings us to a revelation of who this Jesus is. And that's what cries out from within us and says yes to that. But at a, at a head level, in terms of our minds, I don't think I've ever met anyone who has fully comprehended intellectually what they've said yes to supernaturally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so our first steps into relationship with God, number one, are graced to us by God. God initiates these things. Number two, they are supernatural in their nature. Something says yes from inside of us by the power of God and in His Spirit. So we say yes to that. But at, a, at an intellectual level, this is definitely true for my life, and it's true for everybody that I've known and met who is honest about their walk with Jesus. At an intellectual level, the mind picture I had of Jesus, the Jesus I said yes to in my mind when I first came into relationship with him, is not the Jesus I now follow 10 years later, and hopefully will not be the Jesus I follow 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, because my mind is catching up with, if you will, my spirit. Okay, I'm starting to come to the understanding in my mind, of who I said yes to at a supernatural level all those years ago, okay? And that first person I said yes to, I I call this the transference of idolatry, right? So my idols were those things like money, sex, and power. Then Jesus came along. At a supernatural level, something connected, but at a head level in my mind, I really just transferred my idolatry from money, sex, and power to Jesus. But the motivation was the same because the heart posture had not necessarily changed yet. And so although I labeled this new idol Jesus, uh, many of the motivations and many of the functioning systems that brought me to that Jesus were as broken as the functioning systems that had brought me to money, sex, and power. And so the difference, however, is that money, sex, and power had no power to heal me. Whereas this Jesus, even as misinformed as I was and in some ways still am about who he is, is real and has the capacity to bring healing, even if my motivations and intentions are off at the start, right? And so I came to this Jesus, not actually sure of who he was, but at a a supernatural level connected to him in person. And then we started to walk this walk and it led us into relationship and that relationship has been healing because this Jesus is a healing Jesus right um, but one of the things is that as we as this Jesus starts to reveal himself to us as he reveals the truth of who he is there's more and more weight that gets placed upon us because the truth has weight right and so what Jesus wants to do and what God wants to do is he wants to strengthen us he wants to bring us into a place where we are without wax Okay, that we grow in our sincerity of person so that we can 
um, stand up under the weight of who God is. That word weight, you, you know, uh, often in, if you're in Christian circles, you hear the word glory, the glory of God. Right now, that, there's a root word there, which is the word kavod, and that actually means weight. Right, So there's a weightiness to the presence of God. And the more God reveals, the more Jesus reveals to us who he is, the more weight comes with that. And so he wants to simultaneously strengthen us, um, bring us into sincerity of person uh, without wax, right? So that we can increasingly deal with the weight and revelation of who he is. And in that, he's building up this building, the Bible says, of living stones that look like him. So what's the process then of us being made sincere in our thinking? What's the process of our minds catching up with our spirits? Okay, And I would say, and the, the, this is now where we're going to go off on a bunch of different tangents, because the process is a million different things, right? That's the beautiful thing about you, is that you are not a copy-paste anything. This is not a spirituality and spiritual formation. It's not a production line. This is why maybe we should have a problem or at least a, a question around seven steps to anything, five steps to this, ten steps to that, nine quick movements to do this thing. Because whatever we're talking about here is we're talking about revealing the eternal nature of God. And you are a complex individual, <laughs> right? Without being ugly about it, when I look in the mirror and, and I look at what I have to deal with every day, there's complexity to me, man. I don't understand what's happening in me most of the time. And if you're like me, then you know that that is true. So you're complex. So there's no one-size-fits-all process that leads us into the sincerity of spirit so that we become without wax people who have the ability to um, receive the weighty gift of God's glory. And so this is why when we start to talk about, well, how do we enter into sincerity of belief? Uh, we start to move off in all kinds of rabbit trails because every person is different. And that's, that's even more a reason why I believe that God is who he says he is and that Jesus is who he says he is because he can meet all of us in so many different ways until we become these without wax people. So I'm just going to highlight a few of these areas that Judy brought up. And, and man, they're just, they're just good things. So the, so the first thought I want to talk about is the gift of doubt. This really stood out to me, the gift of doubt. Uh, now, I don't know what Christian tradition you grow up in, and if you are not a believer, uh, maybe you're not a believer because of your doubt, right? And depending on, on how you grew up in your spirituality, very often doubt has been turned into an enemy. So, so very often, depending on where, how you grew up, you will come and you will say, you know, I, doubt, I have doubts about some things about God. I have doubts about this, that, or the next thing. And depending on who is leading you or discipling you or growing you in your spirituality, you may receive the unfortunate response of a posture of heart that sees doubt as a negative thing, right? Where some people want to get around you, lay hands on you, and pray out the doubt so that, so that you're not caught up uh, in this doubtful thing. But I actually think that's a, a very superficial perspective on on spiritual formation, on how we become these people without wax, right? Why is that? Because doubt is actually really, really helpful. Doubt is actually a divine thing, provided we doubt with God and not against God, okay? So, so here's what I would say. I would say that your doubt is, is the doorway that you step through into your growth if you will bring your doubts before the Lord. Another way to say it is that when you enter into moments of crisis, they reveal the reality of your belief systems. Uh, an example is, um, you know, when I was a, a younger guy, Jesus uh, had this amazing encounter with Jesus in my car, right? So I'm driving home from a New Year's Eve party. The sun is rising. And as the sun's rising, God's presence fills my car. Very Damascus roady, Paul kind of experience. And I feel the Spirit of God say to me, uh, you'll never be the same. And, and that moment took my, my life on a trajectory that has led me here to a Hobbit house in Germany, right? <laughs> and everything in between. And in that moment of encounter with Jesus, this is what I'm trying to say, is that although at a supernatural level, I, I, I know that something happened beyond what I can comprehend, and my life changed, when I encountered him. And a friend of mine always says, when a bus hits you, you don't choose which bones get broken, right? So when you come into relationship with Jesus, something shifts, something moves. And again, we've spoken about this before. I, I don't want to dictate what moves, 
Every person is different. But that something should move, uh, I think is true, right? Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, when he encounters Jesus, sells everything and follows Jesus. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, when he encounters Jesus, gives half of what he has away. So, so there's, a, there's a response. Those responses look different, but the response is not optional. And so I have this response, and Jesus comes and meets me, and it's all very powerful. And, but here's the thing. I, I, my mind had not caught up with what had happened in my spirit and still has not. Yes. And so I came up against crisis. So in my family, um, uh, there, there was a really difficult thing that happened. Uh, and I remember walking into the living room and my mom and my dad and my, my brothers were all sitting in a circle. And I kind of came home late from work that day. And as I came in, I uh, was invited to sit down. And then my mom shared some news with us. And it was all very traumatic. And I remember in that moment, uh, there was a moment of crisis, a moment of doubt of going, well, Jesus... I didn't think you were like this. The Jesus I met in the car, surely if you're real, Jesus, this shouldn't be happening to me. Surely if you're real, Jesus, I shouldn't be experiencing this pain. My family shouldn't be going through this difficulty. How is this possible, right? If you're with me and if you are who you say you are. And and yet that moment of doubt was actually an opportunity, an invitation to greater depth and breakthrough. As I started to realize that just because I am a follower of Jesus does not mean that I now get preferential treatment. In fact, uh, suffering, although it is not good in and of itself, is a serious. C.S. Lewis talks about God's megaphone to a sleeping world, right? And how Jesus does not exempt us from hardship. So uh, we know this when he says, in this life you'll have many troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And we see this in his performance theater piece of the crucifixion where he, he puts before us a living sacrament of how suffering is turned into healing and resurrection, not by avoiding it, but by embracing it and going through it, right? But I would never have had this revelation and then moved into a deeper space of spirituality and friendship with God if I had not been confronted with suffering of my own and if I had not wrestled with my doubts in that moment. And I know so many people who... uh, Accept at first glance a very plastic version of Jesus that's just going to give them a happy life and make them comfortable and make all their dreams come true. And then they come up against the reality of suffering in the world and doubt enters into the picture. And because they don't have a theology that makes room for doubt and embraces doubt under friendship and lordship of Jesus, that what ends up happening is that doubt begins to build a wedge between them and their God instead of being a bridge between them and their God, right? And they end up walking away from God because they have doubts. If that was true, uh, then Thomas would have a real problem. Right? I, w- I won't believe that Jesus is who he says he is until I can put my hands in his scars. And Jesus doesn't, doesn't hate him for his doubts. Jesus isn't upset with him for his doubts. Jesus doesn't think less of him for his doubts. Jesus embraces his doubts and shows him his scars. And so the encouragement to you and the encouragement to me would be to say, uh, if we want to become people without wax in our belief systems, if we really want to grow into people of substance where we're able to carry the weight of the revelation of the glory of God, the kavod, one of the places where we can definitely grow, one of the trails that will lead us into deeper friendship with God is that place where we have the courage to bring our doubts into the light, right? And a little prayer that I wrote down as I was processing this for myself was to say, God, what gift of doubt do you want to give me today? <laughs> Which is, it, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? And it's not that I'm uh, arrogant and it's not that I think I'm invincible. It's that I just have faith in God, actually. It's that my belief system is that God won't lead me to anything he won't lead me through. I have faith. I have faith that he is the author and the perfecter of my faith, right? So then I believe that a relationship of integrity between me and God, um, I can trust him with my doubts because I can trust that he has the capacity not only to lead me through those doubts, but to make me stronger on the other side, to make me more secure and sincere, to make me a person without wax so that I can handle more and more of the weight of his glory, which is ultimately what all of us So that would be the first big thought, is to say, uh, bring your doubt. Bring your doubt for God. And let your doubt be a bridge 
uh, between you and God, not a barrier between you and God? What, what, what big questions do you have for God that you think are too big? And could it possibly be uh, that those questions have been uh, silent barriers, the elephant in the room that you haven't been addressing, that have been compromising your sense of intimacy with the Father? And is it possible that Jesus is not intimidated by your question and that he invites you to bring it to the table? Talking about uh, intimacy, this brings us to the second thought that really stood out to me from, from Judy's teaching, which is um, this, idea, this idea about the difference between knowledge and knowing. Right. So she has this um, great little phrase that she used, which I thought was great, is that the shortest distance between two people is their story. Right, the, the, this connection between you and I across the table and how um, I can know all about you without even knowing you. Yes? So whoever you are listening to this right now, uh, if you wrote in, and guys, please do write in. If you have questions or thoughts or doubts, uh, email me. You can get hold of me on the website, mattlewis.co.za, or just talk right, right through Instagram and social media and these kinds of things. I'd love for us to have sort of online dialogue and an online community there. But, but let's say uh, you're listening to this, and you reach out, and we start chatting. I could Google you pretty quick and learn a lot about you because that's the world we live in. We all have this digital footprint. And I could know how you like your coffee, and I could know how you like your... Uh, how like your steak and where you like to go on holiday and what books you're reading. And I could know so much about you. I could even know what you look like. And I, I could know a whole bunch of things without ever meeting you. And so if someone said to me, tell me about this person, I could, ha- I could spend a long time rattling off facts, but I don't know you. I don't know your story. I, d- the, I haven't sat with you in those moments of intimacy and vulnerability that build real relationship. Now, when it comes to God, God is a relationship. Yes? We often exclude God from the realm of relationship. We think we have relationships with our moms and dads and romantic relationships and friendship relationships, and then God is this other thing that's excluded from that. Uh, But a friend of mine, he, he often says to me, he says, Matt, God is a relationship just like every other relationship. And how you relate to any relationship is how you relate to all relationships. And so if you have, as an example, an intimacy issue, you have in some relationships, you probably have an intimacy issue in all relationships. And if you can't be vulnerable with people, it's likely you can't be vulnerable with God, right? And so God is a relationship, which means that if we want to start to be, be people who have a revelation of the glory of God, if we want to be people without wax who can handle the weight of his full personhood, one of the rabbit trails, one of the pathways that leads us to become sincere people is when we start to move from just knowledge about God to the knowing of God. And so the question uh, that Judy posed to us is to say, if the shortest distance between two people is their story, um, then what's the longest distance in the world? What's the longest distance between you and God? And then she went on to say, it's the 18 inches between your head and your heart. The 18 inches between what you know in your mind and what you know in your heart. And there is a big difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. And so the invitation is for you and I to say, well, which one are you? Do you know about Jesus? If I were to ask you now who is God, would you give me uh, your, your um, well-read theological uh, summaries? Yes, this is particularly true for friends of mine who, uh, if you're listening into this, guys, and you've done theological study, right? Um, I, I have fallen into this trap where I misinterpreted intimacy for information. And uh, I just felt like if I memorized all the Bible verses and knew all the doctrines and understood the difference between complementarianism and egalitarian and all the big words, and, and if I had these p- opinions and perspectives, and if I could preach good sermons, and if, I, if my theology was tight and systematic in its nature, if I had all these kinds of things, well, then I knew God. But that's not necessarily true. You actually just knew about God, Matt. And I'm learning, being here in this place, that there is a big difference between knowing God and knowing about God. And so if we want to become people who are sincere, who can handle the weight of God's glory, I think what we need to do is we need to shift and move from, uh, from, knowing, God to, uh, from knowing about God to knowing God. And that would be the invitation to you as well. What's one practical way to do this? Um, I was listening to a podcast yesterday 
by John Mark Comer, and he actually referenced a book that I had read by a guy called David Benner called Surrender to, to Love. Thanks, Trevor, if you're listening to this. Thank you for that book. I think I'm going to read it a third time. And um, David Benner talks about this practice that he has where he will simply go and sit and observe God observing him in love. Right? So simple. So he'll take time out. He'll go find a quiet space. He'll sit in his chair. Or like for me, I'm gonna, I, we've got this beautiful forest in the castle where we do these things. Go find a bench in the forest. Or for you, maybe it's a park outside your office block. Or uh, maybe it's, it's one quiet chair in the house. Or maybe it's a walk down the street. So somewhere where you can just get a little bit quiet. If it's really, really busy, uh, a toilet cubicle in the office, right? <laughs> With some headphones in your ears. And just take five minutes and just sit and observe God observing you in love. In your minds, I imagine God watching you in love. And then just allow yourself to be loved and allow yourself to love in response. That, that one practice, right, as you just allow yourself to soak in the presence of God, observe God observing you in love. Uh, that's one way you can start to move from knowing about God to actually knowing God. And then finally, and this is the, the third one, and then we'll close with this. And I could just say, uh, Judy, if you're listening to this, man, I could talk for hours on the stuff that you gave us. So thank you again for that. So this is the final thought that I had. I wanted to talk about starting points. Starting points for you and starting points for Christian people in terms of how we relate to the world. So if you're looking from the outside in and you're going, uh, I may be interested in this Jesus guy, but I'm not sure I can just believe in all these things and just kind of enter into this faith. Where, where do I go from here, Matt? Like if you are sitting and listening in and going, those questions, those questions of origin, who, where am I from, of identity, who am I, and of purpose, what, what am I here for? I resonate with those questions. Those are good questions, and I feel them. If I have a soul, I feel them in my soul. <laughs> and uh, I've been going to Burning Man festivals, and I've, I've been going to Opikopi festivals, and uh, I've been going to parties, and I've been working hard. I mean, I've been putting in like 12-hour days, and I've been climbing the corporate ladder, and I have the car that I dreamed I would have, and currently dating the girl, the guy that I thought I should be dating. And I, I have the clothes that I thought I should wear. And when people look at me from the outside in, they, they, there's admiration. I've climbed the corporate ladder. I have a title and some letters behind my name in the office. And, um, or I have none of those things, but I'm aspiring to get those things. And, that, and, and I am not satisfied with these things. And then you start talking to me about a Jesus guy and a God and a creator. And something stirs in me in a place that I'm not sure even exists. And how do I respond to that? How do I enter into that? What's the first step, right? And if you're a Christian person, uh, it's a good question to think about. How do we relate to the world around us, the people in your workspace, your university space, your classroom space, How do we relate to those people who don't yet believe in Jesus? How do we invite them into the story uh, with as as few unnecessary obstacles as possible? Right. And uh, in our lesson this week, Judy raised just a beautiful little picture, and uh, she said that you can. There's two kind of perspectives. There's there's a perspective of religion, and then there's the perspective of Jesus. And religion has a three step program, which is uh, believe behave, and then maybe if you can behave, you can belong, right? So religion says, here's a set of doctrines, here's a set of theologies, here's a set of scriptures that you have to believe and memorize, here's a set of worldviews that you've got to come around. If you can believe these things, right, if you can believe all of that stuff and say yes to it, then we'll teach you how to behave. So you'll stop smoking, we'll teach you how to stop drinking, how to stop sleeping around, Uh, we'll teach you how to uh, stop wearing so much black and so much makeup and take some of those studs out of your face and whatever the vibe is, we'll tidy you up. And when you can behave like us and believe like us, if you can do that, then maybe just maybe you can belong to us, right? And that's the world of religion. Now, many of us listen to that and we go, that's ridiculous. But if you take a critical look at some of our Christianity, that's exactly what we've done, right? We've made belief a primary issue. 
And we've said, if you can get around these theological doctrine, doctrinal statements, if you, can, if you can believe like we believe, and then if you can behave like we behave, then maybe we'll let you belong like we belong. And so what ends up happening is we build the tribal boundaries between us and them even higher. And those people searching for an answer can't find it because it's living on the other side of a fence that they can't cross. Um, but this is not the way of Jesus. Right, The radical declaration of Jesus, what he comes to declare to the world, is in fact that everyone belongs. <laughs> that there is belonging. That the door is open. We spoke about it last week, right? The Garden of Eden, when guys were kicked out of the garden, the doors got shut. But the new heaven and the new earth, what Jesus is establishing, the doors are always open. And so you person who's searching, who's looking for truth, who's looking for an answer, who's going, uh, something's resonating in a soul I'm not sure I have. Here's the beautiful declaration of Jesus. You belong. When? Now. <laughs> well, how do I belong? You, well, you just, you belong. Because this is the radical, radical proclamation of grace, friends. And can I just say to you, if you're a Christian person and this idea offends you, uh, go to your Bible, read again. Ask God to say to, to, to open your eyes to see what Jesus is really saying. That everybody it belongs. Everyone's invited to the party. Everyone is invited to the party. And when you come into a community of belonging, that will start to change your behavior. And as your behavior starts to change in that space of belonging, it is possible that in your, in your change of behavior, you will move into a space of believing. And that is the beautiful picture. Right. Where do we see this, Matt? Give me a biblical example. Let's talk about Peter for a second. Right? When Jesus invites Peter to follow him, does he say, Peter, here's a theological statement. You go home and memorize that. When you can believe all of that stuff, then you can follow me. He says, no. He says, Peter, you belong. Come follow me. And then Peter follows him. And as Peter is following him, his behavior is shifting. His beliefs are getting challenged. In the space of acceptance and relationship and grace that goes before, there is this open pathway to Jesus. And as Peter comes into that relationship, that's where he starts to be formed. And then eventually, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Peter. This wasn't revealed to you by men, but by God. And so the belief catches up with the belonging as Peter goes into this relationship with Jesus. And we very often as Christian people, we do the exact opposite. We say, when you can get the belief right, then you can belong to us. And I think what we see in Jesus is that actually everyone belongs. <laughs> and we, because you belong, because you're a part of our community, because you are welcome to be with us, then you'll start to see behaviors that look like this Jesus that your soul is longing for. And your be behavior and your belief will start to move and wrestle until such time as you can say by experience that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that would be a challenge for you and that would be a challenge for me is as we want to become people without wax, one of the rabbit trails that we can start to move toward is what is our posture toward those who are on a journey? Are we building higher walls of belief systems between us and them? Or are we opening ourselves up to them? Are we saying, come and recline at table with me? All you prostitutes, all you zealots, all you tax collectors, come be with us. And those of a religious spirit like the Pharisees will look from the outside in and be upset because we're doing this. We're sitting with those we shouldn't be sitting with. But what we see in the life of Jesus is that he's not, he's not, um, he's not shut down by the religious spirit. He he confronts it he comes against it and he shows us a better way and i think as we start to open up our lives so that they become lives of belonging where everybody belongs everybody's in the doors are open everybody come and be with us right i think what happens is we start to become people without wax and when the glory of god starts to be revealed that god is this god of this of this crazy belonging that every, that people are invited to be with this god that the radical declaration of the new testament is that god looks like jesus <laughs> Right. That God is Christ like, and there is, and anything that is not Christ like is not God. Yeah. Um, then when we start to see that, we can, we can handle the weight of that truth and we won't cr be crushed under the pressure of it. And so if you're a seeker, if you're searching, uh, if something is stirring in the soul that you're not sure you have, here would be my invitation to you. You, you belong. Already you belong. 
So just come and sit down at the table. Come and see, come and see, come and be with him. Come and taste the goodness of the God that you're not sure you believe in. That's, it's fine. Uh, and as you do, here's what I'm pretty confident about is that your behavior is going to start shifting as will your beliefs and your mind is going to catch up with what your spirit already knows. And if you're a Christian person, can I invite you, um, lower the boundaries, man, uh, I know theology is important, and I know doctrines are important. That stuff, that it matters. It absolutely matters. But I think the genius is in the order. And I think uh, we've got to start by inviting people to our table so that we can have a conversation, right? Um, so there it is, friends. Uh, those are three rabbit trails uh, <laughs> in the list of hundreds that I could tell you after Judy's teaching uh, that help us become people without wax so that we can handle the weight of the revelation of the glory of God. I pray that as you think about some of these things, you would be led like me um, into a more sincere relationship with God um, where we humbly come before him and ask him to help our minds catch up with what our spirits already know. Uh, Thanks for listening, and we'll chat to you next week. And if you have questions, thoughts, ideas, responses, please respond. I'd love to chat to you guys. I probably will only do it once a week uh, around about this time because I'm limiting my my connection just so I can focus in here. But please, yeah, let's let's talk. And I would love it if you shared this with people, if you think it's helpful and if you liked and left reviews and all those kinds of things, it all helps the message get out. So thanks for listening, guys, and we'll chat to you later. <laughs>